The Bluebird by Maurice Maeterlinck, a review by Louis Hillenbrand. The Bluebird is the 15th play written by a Belgian playwright Maurice Maeterlinck, who was born in 1862 and died in 1949. Maeterlinck is celebrated the world over as the theatrical voice of the Symbolist movement of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Like his predecessors, Maeterlinck focused his playwriting on expressing personal and more spiritual truths with the help of symbols, as opposed to plain language. Key characteristics of his plays include imaginative fantasy settings, as well as typical dialogues tending towards more vague and poetic lines to convey symbolic truths, which influenced the emergence of modernist drama to a great level. He is mostly known for his fifth play published in 1892 called Peleas and Médisande, a work set in an imaginary medieval world featuring both key features typically associated with his writing. According to his own words, Maeterlinck believed that theater was the temple of dreams. He considered art's supreme mission to be the revelation of infinity and greatness, but also the secret beauty of man. Like his fellow symbolist writers, he deeply valued imagination, and suggested that art was but an indirect channel, nourishing the soul with glimpses of the absolute. Concerning theater in particular, he expressed his distrust of man's attempt to give life to those impressions of ultimate beauty. For him, a finite person enacting such sacred symbols was close to sacrilege, a genuine profanation of his temple of dreams. He admired ancient Greek theater's indulgence and reverence towards those symbols through the wearing of masks to hide the finite in the enactment of the infinite. That is why he wrote many plays for puppets, and that most of his masterpieces have an otherworldly tone and themes. Such was the case for the Bluebird. It premiered at the Moscow Art Theater in 1908 and was an immense success. It tells the story of two brothers and sisters, Tiltil and Mithil, the children of a lumberjack and his wife, who are visited by a fairy disguised as an old lady. She asks them to retrieve a magical bluebird for her sick daughter who desires happiness. Before sending them on their mission, the fairy gives them a special hat with a diamond on it that, upon being turned, allows the children to see reality from a completely new perspective. That is why the souls of their dog, their cat, sugar, bread, water, and fire come alive and accompany them on their dream journey, in which they are guided by the sacred and motherly character Light to find the mythical bird. They begin their search in the land of memory, where they meet their deceased grandparents and brothers and sisters, enjoying their new life free of all anxiety. They eventually catch glimpse of what appears to be a blue bird, which they bring along on their journey but turns black in the end. Afterwards, they venture into the Palace of Night, where Night, surrounded by her two children, sleep, and another whose name she says is not pleasant to hear, shows the children a set of doors behind which are locked all the evils, plagues, sicknesses, terrors, catastrophes, and mysteries that have tormented men since the beginning of time. After they've explored each door, the final gate shows a splendid garden with countless bluebirds in it that they try to capture and bring along on their journey, only for them to die as they enter another realm called the forest. In that new magical place, a group of trees and animals mount an attack on the children as a rebellion against man. Thankfully, their dog and light come to the rescue so they can move on to the Palace of Happiness. There, they first encounter the luxuries who escape upon the entrance of light and make way for the true happinesses, with motherly love having a special bond with light. The children are gifted with touching words of wisdom, but they must continue their voyage to find the bluebird. After they've entered an eerie graveyard, the light of day soon reveals the land of the future, where they befriend unborn children who are waiting for the character time to come and take them away to where they are to be born. With time literally running out, the children must bid farewell to their friends and light and return to their home, where they wake up having a completely new and joyous perspective on the everyday elements that accompany them on their journey. The play ends with the old lady of the beginning telling Tiltil that her sick daughter would be very happy if she could have his bird that suddenly turns blue. He then gives the old lady his bird for her daughter, who returns with it happy and well. In their sheer excitement, however, 
The bluebird escapes through the window, but the children swear that they will find it again and ask the audience to look for it carefully as well. In my opinion, the bluebird is the culminating point of the symbolist genius. It is a celebration of imagination and revelry, but it also embraces the human condition fully. I found the encounters in the Palace of Night and the Palace of Happiness to be particularly evocative and thought-provoking. The symbolists saw imagination as the supreme delight, the only way to escape the fatality of existence. In many of their works we see a shared desire to lose oneself in that otherworldly realm in the face of the harshness of reality. Maurice Maeterling acknowledges this concern in his plays, most of them exploring the concept of death and the meaning of life. However, he does present a solution to this existential dread in The Bluebird. In its plea for the enjoyment of the small everyday things in life to find contentment, we can see the influence of the thought of Jan van Ruysbroek, a Flemish Christian mystic whose works Maeterlinck translated into French. Maeterlinck was raised in a French-speaking conservative Catholic household in Flanders, and his enticement for the mystical writings of Jan van Ruysbroek can also be seen in his collection of essays, the Treasure of the Humble, published in 1896. At its core, Christian mysticism is a theological tradition within Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy in particular that, like many other spiritual traditions in the world, promotes the marriage of one's soul with the divine. To do this, Christian mystics from John of the Cross to Thomas Merton preach the shedding of one's ego through humility and seeking the divine in everything both the grand and small things. The way Tiltil and Mithil learned to see the souls of everyday items like bread, sugar, water as well as their pets, thanks to a guiding character called Light, hints at such a desire to embrace the little things, especially when the children are so happy to see the aforementioned characters in their normal form upon waking up from their dream journey. The celebration of simple family life also enhances this theme of gratitude and simple enjoyment to find happiness, to find one's bluebird. The play was immensely successful. Only two years after its premiere in Moscow, a silent movie adaptation was made as early as 1910, which was followed by another, more successful American version in 1918. One year later, in 1919, it was made into an opera by composer Albert Wolf, who, alongside Claude Debussy, Gabriel Fauré, Jean Sibelius, and Arnold Schoenberg, is one of the many composers who drew inspiration from Materling's works for their music. Later on, it was adapted into a Technicolor movie in 1940 by the American studio 20th Century Pictures, one year after the classic The Wizard of Oz with which it shares certain characteristics such as journeying from a bleak world into colorful realms populated with extravagant characters. Since the second half of the 20th century, however, it seems to have become a less popular children's read in French literature. One of the last Western cinematic adaptations comes from 1970 and was made in the Soviet Union where the promotion of enjoying the little things was probably seen as a theme compatible with communist ideology. The most recent theatrical adaptation that I have personally heard of comes from Japan where a handful of animes have actually made reference to the play, including even Pokemon, with Swablu and Altaris being known in Japanese as Tilt and Tiltelis. The reason for that, in my opinion, is because there exists a belief in Japanese folklore about the so-called Tsukomogami, or objects that have acquired a soul, which is basically what happens in the play. This idea of treating objects as soulful beings, though seemingly oriental in nature, does find its echoes in the West in the person of Swiss analytical psychologist Carl Gustav Jung, who, after his death, was described by his maid as having a special relationship with his everyday objects, treating them like friends. Being a great admirer of Jungian thought, I can tell how this idea could contribute to the overall psychological integration and individuation of one's being to find greater happiness in life, which Materling, years ahead of his time, had already discovered. In conclusion, the Bluebird is an overshadowed masterpiece that has genuine and eternal wisdom to disclose to children and readers of all ages. It presents fantasy realms seldom equal during the time it was written, especially when it comes to theater. Every read sheds new light on the human condition, gives new insight, and nourishes the soul even more. 
It is a work of art that has very happily surprised me and found its place among my favorite books of all time, and I can only hope that this review may entice other readers to appreciate its beauty in their search for their own bluebird. Thank you for watching. If you liked what you saw, you may give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel for more content of the like. I wish you all a wonderful day and hope to hear from you soon.